That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about our 10 favorite films, well, theatrical releases technically, of 2020. Yes. This has been an interesting year for film. Mm. With the pandemic. For many things, yes. But theaters shutting down. Um, you're very accustomed to watching screenings like in screening rooms. Oh yeah, yeah, like four or five times a week. So that's weeks. all been uh, sort of dropped for online screenings. Mm -hmm. Which, strangely, it's felt busier than ever as far as film watching and reviewing goes because there's a deluge of availability now. Um, also, I think previously the idea of watching a movie like on my like device like an iPad or my laptop or even my phone is just like incomprehensible. Yes. I still don't like doing it. Sacrilegious. Well, we have a very nice setup like mm -hmm. surround sound and Apple TV and big screen. So it's very comfortable. And now I actually think I prefer watching. Oh, I don't. No, I, I would like to return to theaters. Thank you. Someday. Well, you can go, of course. Um, anyway, we're going to talk about our favorite film. So why don't you define what your favorite is, since that seems to be difficult for you to do. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, that, that, what the word favorite means. What does the word favorite mean to you? Films that I like. <laughs> so the 10 films the film you that, liked the most. The films that had the most impact on me for whatever reason. Uh, you know, I'm also a bit uh, more attracted to darker, weirder, perverse things per se than the mainstream. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Russian literature. So dark, depressing, dank, love all that. Love all that. Uh, subversive, anything that has, you know, something to say usually will get my attention. Um, but yeah, favor to me means, it, it, to me that doesn't mean, always mean about rewatchability, which I know when you explain what your favorite means to you is a, a large component of that. Um, to me, film is art uh, and for, whatever reason I think that these are what stand out as the 10 best. Great. To me. For me, favorite means like the most enjoyable viewing experience. Films that I would want to rewatch, <laughs> films that made me laugh, rarely cry, think, um, films that like invoke me to want to talk about them. Uh, there are several films I gave high scores to this year that are not on my favorites list because I can recognize quality filmmaking, but not enjoy it. So um, I, this list is purely just like what I enjoyed the most watching. I think the word I'm glomming onto from that is what we each mean by enjoyment and sure. what, what you enjoy. Like I, I do enjoy uh, an emotional roller coaster, if you will. I do enjoy being uncomfortable. Um, I, you know, I had, a, I had a professor in my undergrad that once said, anytime you leave a film feeling satisfied, there's something wrong. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and obviously that's not everybody's uh, cup of tea when it comes to how they prefer to enjoy their cinema. Uh, but to me, there, there's something to be said. That means it's stuck with you. That means it's effective. That means it's, it's done its duty per se. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so all of the films we're going to list, we have either done video reviews for them or you wrote a review for Ion Cinema. So the links will be below. Correct. Um, and I have to do a top 20 favorites for Ion Cinema. So if you're interested in my 11 through 20, it will be there. Uh, also, we uh, are going to announce our least favorite film or could be films of 2020 at the end. So why don't you start? So you want me to name all of mine and then all of yours instead of what alternating? Is, yes, so start with number 10. Okay, uh, my number 10 uh, spot for my favorite films of 2020, Sputnik, uh, director, uh, first time director Igor Abramenko. Uh, it's a Russian sci-fi film. It stars uh, Oksana Akinshina, who is in Lilia Forever. Um, the Lucas Moodyson film. Uh, it's just been a while since I've seen a genre film that while has familiar elements is very effective on every front. Uh, acting, narrative, uh, special effects, uh, gross out factor. If you like creature features, Sputnik is up there. Number nine? Number nine, uh, Possessor, uh, the sophomore film from Brandon Cronenberg, son of David Cronenberg. Uh, I wasn't even so much a fan of Brandon Cronenberg's first film, uh, Antiviral, back in 2012, but this, this hit all the marks for me uh, as far as a futuristic uh, technological identity uh, issue film. 
Number eight. Eight Black Bear, uh, directed by Lawrence Michael Levine. Uh, I, you know, I went into this. Uh, it was it played at Sundance last in 2020. Uh, I had kind of low expectations, uh, just based on a lot of output from people that came out of kind of that mumblecore era of indie filmmaking in the U.S. Um, and I was just blown away. I think Aubrey Plaza is fantastic. Uh, I, again, I love uh, its identity play. Uh, it's how it uh, looks at cinema um, yeah I just I thought it was fantastic it's depressing loved it uh, number seven Ma Rainey's Black Bottom uh, George C. Wolf as director who's of course a major uh, Broadway theater director has done several other films uh, the Swan Song of Chadwick Boseman uh, anytime uh, there's an August Wilson adaptation I'm there uh, but really Violet Davis oh my god <laughs> Like, she's such a well-known uh, and intense presence, you already have such expectations, and it's rare when somebody of her caliber, I think, can pivot in a way that I was forgetting it was her. Like, Michael Douglas as uh, Liberace is another kind of uh, moment where I felt that way. I, for somebody like Michael to forget who he is, but um, yeah, just, I, I think it'd be fantastic if she won two Oscars, each for an August Wilson adaptation. Um, <clears throat> number six, Dear Comrades, the latest film directed by Andrei Konchalovsky. Uh, Konchalovsky, of course, is a favorite of mine. He started out working under Tarkovsky. Um, and just, if any time that he has a film out, uh, including his Hollywood output, output in the 80s and 90s, like Tango and Cash and Runaway Train, of course, uh, his last film, Paradise, was my number one film that year. Uh, which was a 2017 theatrical release in the U.S. Uh, but th this film is a black and white, depressing uh, Russian drama about a group of uh, protesters who are massacred by the government and a mother uh, trying to find her daughter in kind of the, the melee. Uh, and uh, Konchalovsky, the woman who started most of his later films, Julia Vysotskaya, uh, excellent performance. It won a special jury prize at Venice this year, I believe. Number five, The 40-Year-Old Version, uh, the directorial debut of Rada Blank. I knew little about it other than that she had won Best Director at Sundance, uh, and it was her debut. Uh, you weren't even interested in watching it because I initially started it by myself, and you're instantly uh, transfixed by her presence, her performance, uh, her uh, rapping skills, just everything about it. It feels very much like handcrafted by somebody who has something to say. Uh, number four, The Surrogate, uh, directed by Jeremy Hirsch. Again, uh, a, a moral dilemma drama that's right up my alley uh, with, a, a, again, a fantastic performance from a newcomer, relative newcomer, Jasmine Batchelor, uh, as this uh, black woman who decides to have, uh, to be the surrogate for her gay best friends and then finds out the child has uh, Down syndrome and then how that causes this unraveling for all of them. Just a, an excellent moral drama. Um, number three, Antebellum, directed by Gerard Bush and Christopher Renz. Again, uh, all I knew was from the production uh, material that it starred Janelle Monet. so I went into it completely blind. Uh, I understand it's a very uh, divisive film, uh, but I, you know, to, for having watched so many films about slavery that all try to, that are all of course set in the past and trying to show how how far we've come since then to kind of have a film pivot exactly away from that and show how I think one of the taglines is the past is the present. Um, soundtrack, performances, everything about this film. I love the twist. Uh, it's a fantastic film to talk about and unpack with people, whether you liked it or not. Um, the, to me, this is what cinema should be about on all fronts. Um, number two, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, the third film directed by Eliza Hittman. Uh, you know, boiled down as an abortion drama, but still just as important as ever. Two fantastic lead performances. Uh, love the look. Uh, it's very poignant, very moving, very compelling. Uh, competed in Sundance and Berlin, won major awards out of both of those festivals. Um, <clears throat> I, and I was already a, a, fi a fan of Eliza Hittman from her uh, it felt like love and beach rats, which you've seen, mm -hmm. um, and you haven't seen Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, but just very memorable, uh, impactful film. Um, 
and my number one favorite film dun, 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 dun. of 2020, uh, which won't become as a big surprise because it was on our midway year list too, um, Dao Natasha, uh, one of the Dao films uh, directed by Ilya Karjanovsky. Uh, and if you've never heard of the of Dao or the project that that was, please look it up. It's there's nothing else like it. This premiered in competition at uh, Berlin, uh, won a cinematography award, uh, but the lead performance by N uh, Natalie Berzhnaya, just fantastic. It's a terrifying film, it's a, it's a funny film, it's a depressing film, it's a despairing film. Uh, th yes, I, I was just absolutely in love. And I've had the opportunity, because they're all, a majority of the Dow segments, because it was there was hundreds of hours of footage put together, uh, are available on the, the Dow website. Um, and one of them is six hours long, one segment on its own. But to me, this uh, encapsulates everything that I think he was really trying to do with that project. And I, I just can't say enough how much I love that film. Understood. So that's my top 10 favorite films of 2020. <clears throat> Good job. So I have seen seven out of your 10. Okay. And you and I share three. Mm -hmm. My list is not as elevated as yours, but... Um, it's favorites. But, you know, people still care. So my number 10 is a film called Shit House, which is directed by... Cooper Rafe. Who also stars in the film. He is a first-time director. Um, this story about a freshman in college who is having trouble adjusting, like is so like i'm twice as old as this character my college experience was like the exact opposite yet the storytelling is so effective that i felt like i was him and his portrayal is so sensitive and sweet and it's funny um zantippi from kimmy schmidt what's her name oh i don't the character name or the actor I, whatever I, I, she's in this movie too and i if you would have told me she was in it i probably would have thought i wouldn't care for her but i thought her characterization's great uh, it really took me on a little journey and I enjoyed it very much. I notably won uh, the top prize out of South by Southwest. Well deserved. My number nine is Sputnik. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I'll add to what you said is because of the pandemic and a lot of things not being released or what people thought were like, you know, people were just dumping their crap films during this period. We had seen a number of like horror sci-fi films prior to Sputnik that were subpar. Mm -hmm. So I was so hungry for something decent and Sputnik, you know, obviously was a watch for me because it is horror. And I was so, so pleased mm -hmm. with everything you said, the acting, the special effects, the story, very well done. My number eight is a little film called Spree, mm -hmm. directed by... Eugene Kotlarenko, um, also a Sundance premiere. <laughs> Just about this kid who's obsessed with social media and goes on a killing spree for attention. It was just a very enjoyable experience. It feels very timely and I don't know how well it will age, but based on my criteria, I thoroughly enjoyed it. There were a number of WTF moments. Mm -hmm. My number seven film is Bad Education. Mm -hmm. Not the Almod of our film. No, not La Bala Education. Um, starring Hugh Jackman and Allison Janney. It's based on a superintendent who stole a bunch of money from the school district. Watching Hugh Jackman play a gay man felt very good. <laughs> he does a very good job. I already really like Allison Janney, and she is just so watchable on screen. Um, I really like the story because it it is thrilling and suspenseful and enough and made me uncomfortable enough over something that is very like you know like white collar mm -hmm. almost to the level of like a serious like violent crime drama so i really really enjoyed it my number six film is the invisible man um we had seen another a couple of bloomhouse films prior to this one that i did not enjoy so walking into the invisible man I did not have high hopes. And the woman who stars Elizabeth Moss, Moss um, who directed this film? Lee Winnell. Uh, I didn't really know Elizabeth Moss that well, but damn, her portrayal of this like frazzled, emotionally distraught woman was so effective. I thought the story was well done for something that is, um, you know, familiar and mm -hmm. a remake. But yeah, very good. My number five film was my number one film in our mid-year list, which is Gretel and Hansel, mm -hmm. directed by... Haas Perkins, son of Anthony. That's right. Mm -hmm. I just enjoyed this story. It's like like a darker take on a 
well, I mean, these grim fairy tales are already dark, mm -hmm. but this was like more true to the source material. Um, I loved how it looked. Mm -hmm. And that damn lady who played the witch, what's Al her name? Alex Creed. Who I know from uh, Sleepwalkers. Sleepwalkers. Mm -hmm. Oh, so good. Yeah, I could watch that movie she's again. She's pretty good, I am. Yeah. My number four film is Antebellum. Mm -hmm. um, I, I echo your thoughts. Uh, definitely something that I really, really enjoy talking about. Initially, I so I started. You had already watched it, and then I watched it separately. Could well, you you started it with me, and you're like, I can't do it. I can't do it. So Nick finished. Then you spoiled it for me and told me the twist, and it sounded good. So I went back and watched it, and was um, very um, pleased. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a divisive film, good or bad. It was. It's an excellent conversation piece. Um, so I, I definitely recommend it and I would watch it again. Number three, Bad Hair, directed by... Justin Simeon. Who's Dear White People. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, like, late 80s Los Angeles with R&B hip-hop is, like, very much my vibe. So already it's a win. The cast is so fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Including Vanessa Williams. Kelly Rowland plays a Janet Jackson-like character who's possessed. Just a really fun film, despite kind of feeling a little crunchy and cheap, and but it worked very well for me, and I would definitely recommend it. My number two film is the forty-year-old version. Uh, you were watching it; I hadn't agreed to watch it, but I was walking by and saw Rada Blank, mm -hmm. and was transfixed. So asked you to rewind it, watched it and was so impressed. Mm -hmm. There is so much going on in this film. Yeah. And to think that this per this woman, person, like like you said, clearly has something to say. There's so much going on. I mean, this lady wrote these raps, performed them, is acting in this film. There's a component of the film where like a stage play is being put on. It's very layered. I like the characterizations, particularly there's a, a like a white producer mm -hmm. who is supposed to, I feel like, represent like her savior who really is not looking out for her best yeah. interest. I thought that was well done. Rada's character's um, best friend is this gay Asian man. I really liked that. I would definitely recommend this film and I would absolutely watch her, like anything else she does. Mm -hmm. Okay, my number one selection <laughs> really fits my criteria of just the experience of watching it and this film is The Empty Man. Mm -hmm. And I know people didn't like this film, Correct. which I think is unfair. It's directed by David Pryor. So we saw this in October around Halloween mm -hmm. and we hadn't been to a theater in seven months because of the pandemic. We were in San Diego for my birthday, mm -hmm. just like hanging out by ourselves in a hotel and theaters were open. Everything that was showing we had already seen except The Empty Man. Mm -hmm. And I read reviews, very poor reviews, people comparing it to like shitty movies like Bye Bye Man and things like that. But it was our only option. And wow, I was so impressed. This film gave me everything I needed. Kind of like Dr. Sleep, which I know you didn't love, but I just like it. I mean, if you're gonna keep me in a theater for more than two hours, there better be a lot going on. And there definitely and, was. And The Empty Man has a lot going on. Just from the opening, like 15 minute intro, where we're introduced to the idea of the lore of The Empty Man, to there's an entire component that's like this Scientology-like cult that is worshiping the spirit of The Empty Man, to, um, the main character, whose name is... Who's played by, I believe it's James Oh, who's Badger played by Hill. James... I really, really liked him. Uh, there's just so much going on. And I think the experience of being able to watch it in a theater for the first time in so long um, elevated it. But I would still watch it again. And I think it's effective. Oh, yeah, I agree. I, I think it's one of those things that the packaging is confusing to people. So they want to compare it to... The lesser films, like lesser films, but, this but it looks expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to me, that was that you know, on par with the original Wicker Man, as far as creepy, weird stories about people being, you know, pre-selected for insidious things. Uh, I did really like that film. Yeah. Yeah. So we had said as a treat, because I don't want to spread too much hate, but um, that we would list our worst or least favorite film of 2020. And it just so happens that there was a tie and we both had the same tie. Mm -hmm. So we'll just announce our 
two least favorite films of 2020. Mm -hmm. The first is Let's Scare Julie, uh -huh. directed by... Judd Cremata. Ooh, child. What? <laughs> about a group of teenage girls in a house who are talking about the neighbor across the street and how they want to scare her. And for the first, like, 40 minutes, it's just them in this room talking about it and some of them go and come back. Like, they go do this thing that we're excited to watch. Like, the name of the film is Let's Scare Julie. We don't actually see them scare her. Mm -hmm. We're just stuck in this house with these awful characters, namely one who's like a Natasha Leone ripoff who is so annoying. I haven't been that annoyed by a character in a long time. And then the story is weak. Yeah, there's so weak. It, it's, it was hard because there's really nothing redeeming about it at all. Ugh. Um, what would you say about it? I, I just uh, unpleasant. We, we unpleasant. each gave it 0.5 out of five stars. Uh, yeah, <laughs> which is kind of the criteria is well, what did we give our lowest scores to yeah. this year? Um, and then what's our other selection? Fantasy Island, uh, directed by Jeff Wadlow, who also did Truth or Dare previously for Blumhouse. Can I just say, so a nice thing about living in LA is like we, well, you more than I, but like get to go to screenings at like nice screening rooms on lots. Mm -hmm. And Fantasy Island was screened at Sony Studios, mm -hmm. which is not a far drive, but you know, it's still a process of like going, going through security, letting them valet my car. You know, there's an embargo, they're all strict about it. I just sit in this screening room that's all cold and small and have an awkward in encounter in a restroom and <laughs> to watch this movie that was so shitty. Mm -hmm. And someone, like they have to know it was bad. Well, I believe the embargo was the day, till the day it opened, so... Right, and so I think just the sting of going through all that to then sit through this dumb-ass movie... It was pretty bad, yeah. And I, I think what really stung was Michael Pena, is that his name? Mm -hmm. Playing Ricardo Montalban's character of... Uh, oh, I forgot that character's name, but... Um, so miscast. I think there were a lot of uh, terrible choices made. Oh my god, so many of those characters annoyed the hell out of me. It just wasn't good. But anyway, that's it. Yeah. Well, what would you like to say? Oh, I'm just looking forward to everybody getting vaccinated and uh, hopefully resuming some sense of, you know, life outside of the house. Yeah. Um, hopefully by mid 2021. I don't know. <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year.